back. I had one question in the break that I will uh, follow up on. That was the very brief version was saying, well, everyone just makes this step without really caring about what happens in between. And you see that in many techniques before. So I think it's fair to just take the time and then do it a little bit more proper. So what we have to do is we have to differentiate with respect to theta, and what we have to differentiate is y minus x theta and close y minus x theta. Now, we know that this in here is an inner product that gives us a scalar. <coughs> Keep that in mind when we move forward. Basically what we do, we can do that this in many ways. Basically what we do is we just differentiate a product. We also said it worked before. So what we do is that we differentiate the first one and multiply it with the second one plus the reverse. So when we differentiate this, we have this just close. We can talk about it, we can do it in two ways here. Just look at the parentheses in here and differentiate this with respect to theta. What we get out is minus x. And then we just have to add the two close. The question we had to break is well, another way of saying this would be to say we'll take this parentheses and move it out a little bit and transpose both parts inside. Differentiate those two individual. So first one differentiated, multiply it with the second one. Y minus x theta. Then we have to say plus first one as y minus x theta. Transpose. Multiply it on the second one, differentiate. Well, this gives minus x. Now, we have this minus, I just want to move that out here. We have a minus, and write everything else the same. x transpose y minus x theta minus y minus x theta transpose, transpose, and then just x because we move the minus up. Now, this is where it's not so tricky, but we just have to look at these two terms here. What holds about those two? They are identical. They are actually not identical. But it's the transpose. And I did this wrong in the break. They're not actually scalars. I have to write it with respect to theta. What we get out is a vector. But you can see that this element here is equal to this one transpose. But if you transpose this, then you shift the order of the elements, transpose the paths. So that is that moves first, it gets transposed. So numerically it's the same. So it is the same values that are there. So therefore if they're the same, we can pick either order. And what I just did over there is to just write minus 2 x y minus x. That part is to kind of realize that those are actually the same. So that's, that's the missing link from before. So now we will move on to what's 
or weight in these squares. This is just almost the same story. We have the same model as such. The only thing that we change is, well, we keep the expected value of the epsilon to be zero, and the variance, the covariance matrix is now different. Before we had sigma squared, and what I used over here was that, uh, well, this part here is equal to the identity matrix times lowercase sigma squared. Now we will say that we can have another matrix here, not the identity matrix. Basically, what we then want to minimize, but we should let us know. We want to minimize where we add sigma inverse inside here. Now, if we differentiate this one, now I'll just do the very fast notation here. Then that doesn't have anything to do with data. So in all differentiation and so forth, it's invariant. So it moves down here. That also means that it gets into both terms down here. So we have a sigma inverse. So those two places. Then I probably just have to keep them there. And again, finally down here. If you look at it carefully, everywhere there is an X transpose, it's followed by a sigma inverse. There, 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 everywhere. That's one way of keeping control over that. So I won't go through the whole calculation because it's effectively the same except for just writing sigma inverse inside everywhere. So to minimize this, well, the solution is parallel to before. We just have the sigma inverse after each x transpose here. And again, we need x transpose sigma inverse x to be invertible. Or well, just x transpose x. But now, with the weights, it still needs to be invertible. And an estimate of sigma square is parallel to before. We take the, what we minimized here, this weight is sum of square residuals, and then we divide by n minus p. There are two things here that will change the notation, or not so much notation, but a little bit, anyways. Here it says yoga sigma square times uppercase sigma. So we split the covariant from last week, we split that in a scalar that is using the variance throughout all observations, and then something that gives weight and structure to the procedures. So last week we just had a sigma that was the covariance. The covariance is the product of lowercase sigma square times uppercase sigma. So that was what we kind of looked at. So Okay, sigma can be used with or without a scaling variance. So that's one thing we will get back to and we have to keep in mind. In particular, it gets important when you look at how many degrees of freedom do you have. But we'll get back to that. This works okay, except when you have a lot of zeros in the diagonal of this matrix. But we'll try not to have too many zeros. Now we won't discuss that. So what I'll do now is to look at an example. Modeling the correlation in our observation of Garrick radiation whenever you have a clear sky. It's also in the book, but I will open the paper. So, 
This is the data that we have. We have the solar elevation degree. Well, we know the sun rise and then at some point it gets down again. And when they have, what is the power from the direct radiation? And then in here, the full drawn line here is the final model that we'll get to in a moment. And then there are dots connected corresponding to particular days. And what to observe here is that when you look at these particular days, it goes up and down following a line that is close to the fit, following the same shape somehow, which is not unexpected. But on the other hand, what we also observe is, well, particularly very clear from the 1968 case here is, well, the residuals tend to have the same sign. So they are not independent. Which means that the variance that we see here maybe is appearing larger than it actually is. Because whenever something is off, it stays off. And other things to notice, I don't know how many of you have made, mm. but there's one more thing here that is not how we would want things to be. I'll mention the correlations. So they're not independent. What else could they be? To the ordinary least squares regression, there's one more thing that had to be fulfilled. I mentioned it a couple of times today. Independently. <laughs> yes. Is that the case here? Are they identically distributed? Why I can say why are they not? How are they not? It seems like they are uh, truncated. Like maybe so the variance is larger. So truncation is one thing. Yeah. Okay. And that is also relevant here because actually I think you're both you're writing more than one way because the variance here seems to be larger when the elevation is small, that's partly due to the way they measure it, because you measure it on a horizontal surface. And when the sun rises, the angle of attack is larger, and then when the sun gets up, the angle is more direct hit. So, the variance here is larger, but effectively it's also truncated, because you don't have any negative radiation measure. But such you actually write in two ways. And we tend to say, well, truncation um, is like that. Sometimes we just ignore it, but sometimes the effect of truncation is so large that we have to deal with it. Sometimes we make a transformation so that it's not a problem. There are many different ways of getting about things. So, the outline here is they want to fit a model of the following structure where what we have is the direct radiation as a function of the elevation angle or height is a constant times 1 minus the exponential of another constant times the height, and then some noise structure. And then the question is, how should we deal with the noise structure? Well, the generic setting is this. So what we have to look at is the okay sigma there. So the naive approach, what we've done many times by now, is to just say, well, that's the identity matrix. 
Well, we saw that there is correlation. So we could also do a model where we say that, well, we have rho, which is some constant between 0 and 1. And then we say, what is the time difference? The closer in time we are, the higher is the correlation. So if rho is, say, 0.9, that means if you're 1 observation apart, the correlation is 0.9. If you're 2, you're 9 squared, 0.9 squared, and so forth. So it just drops exponentially. And then we have the discussion about the variance in immunity that can be described in this way based on the physics of how you have the angle attack and how you make the measurements. Or you can combine the two. For various reasons, you can kind of look at all of them. So if you go back to the paper and then go down to the estimates down here, those are actually the structures that we have over there. Except that the order of those two is false. Now, what we look at here are the estimates. What we really care about is the A, what is the level that we can get up to, and the B, that is the shape of the curve. And if we just do the, use the naive assumption of IID, when you do the estimate, you get, say, almost 800. When you include some structure, the level actually increases. So the estimated peak radiation increase depending on the variance structure. Well, what I think is also interesting is the uncertainty, the variance that is given down here, or standard deviation, sorry, is also changed quite a bit. It's lower when you only have the variance kind of structure when you include the correlation structure, as mentioned before, then you don't have, effectively, you just have every day have an observation because they are correlated. So you don't have 10 observations one day. You have maybe, say, two or three effective observations because of the correlation. That's one thing. And the estimate of B, that is the slope, also changes from 800 to 6 parts, 100 parts. So that's actually, I mean, a fairly large change. But the biggest change is on the estimate of sigma squared. The change is by more than a factor of 10. And can you figure out? No, I don't think you can. But it's kind of weird. Why, why is it so different? not expect that, right? You would expect everything to be so all of magnitude, but better and better and better the further you get down to the more complex models. But let's just look at what happens here. When you include the variance structure and only the variance structure, then you get a marked reduction. When you then take the correlation structure instead of the variance structure, then you have, again, a large estimate. And when you have both, you get the smallest estimate. But it's the variance structure that does the trick here, right? Let's get back and look at what the variance structure is. 1 divided by the sine of the angle at some point in time times the sine at the angle at a different point in time. Now, what values do we get here? Below one. They're all below one, exactly. Marked below one because the angle is. Oh, sorry, not below one. Sign 
of something is below one. Oh yeah. And you oh. divide by it. Sorry. <laughs> you divide by a number that is a multiplication of two numbers that are both below one. And they are actually quite a bit below one. But if you go back to the data. angle doesn't get much above, say, 55 degrees. So we are definitely far from sign of something to be one. We have a lot of factors there. That's the reason why when you have a scalar, when you, when you multiply with something that is greater than one, of course, then the estimate of the sigma there has to compensate for that. So think of that. If you look at the correlation structure there, and if you look at the correlation with yourself, that's rho to the zero power, which is one. So only using the correlation structure, you have something where the, at the diagonal is a sequence of ones, but when you have the variance part here, the diagonal becomes a sequence of numbers that are all greater than one. When the angle is close to zero, it's much greater than one. So that is the reason why those numbers out there just change dramatically. That's the reason why we actually cannot use those to say which one is better. But we can see that the later the, the model, both components included, gives a good description. How should we pick which model is better? Pick that based on how well the model fulfills the assumptions. Not due to, I like 842 more than 822. Pick the one where the assumptions for the model are fulfilled. So since we saw that we both have correlation structures and we have variance in Ugeniti, then we should pick the final model and look into the residuals of that and say, are everything as we wanted it to be? So, that was one example saying a lot of things about how to do models. And at the end of this course, you can say, I hope I have exposed you to a lot of different kinds of data, because I know you are from different backgrounds. And whenever you go into a different field, the biggest challenge is to figure out how is this different from what I used to know. I don't know how many of you have changed subjects, like from chemistry to biology to physics. Um, but whenever you go into something totally new, doing mathematical modeling, I often change something, and I like that. But you have to listen to people to figure out what is actually important in your subject. So, the last method is maximum likelihood. And I know that some of you have seen this. Basically, I will do it for the weighted case where you have structured residuals. We will again assume that the sigma is no. So that's the nice case. And the estimator of theta is exactly the same as the weighted least squares estimator. Now, how is it that the maximum likelihood work? Well, <coughs> basically, we have to write up the multivariate normal distribution, all the joint density, all the observations, write a little bit different than last week. That's why I have it here on paper. Two pi, and then I have the sigma square in here, up to raising the n half power, and then the square root of the determinant of the structure of the residuals times the exponential 
of 1 minus 2 sigma squared x transpose oh sorry I got too busy y minus x theta transpose and then I have the sigma inverse and then I have y minus x theta and close so the big difference here is that last week I assumed that uppercase sigma was a full covariance matrix now it's just a structure so I have pulled the um, Um, so I put the sigma square outside of the uppercase sigma inverse. That's the main difference from how it was written last week. It's here that I took the sigma square and put the inverse out here, and it's here where I took it from the determinant and I write it there. But it's the same. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. Look at the properties of the maximum diagonal estimator. Again, it's unbiased. Well, it's the same estimator as before, no big surprise. We have a variance estimator here. That is effectively the same, except that we assume log a sigma square to be known. And this is where likelihood theory is a little bit different. If we want to estimate theta and do maximum likelihood, as in we want to maximize this expression over here, that given that theta is known, then we don't have to divide by n minus p, but just put n. So if we do an estimator of sigma square, it will be biased if you do maximum likelihood. But you can easily correct for that. That's the important part. So, how is this maximum likelihood the same? Well, maximizing with respect to theta, that means we differentiate and equate to zero, right? So, to maximize this here, well, there's no theta in the first bit here. In the second bit here, well, you have exponential of, some, of something. How do you maximize the exponential of something? Well, you do that by maximizing what is inside. You start with a minus. So what you do is that you want to minimize the rest of this. Theta squared is a constant, so we're left with <coughs> hey, That's exactly where we started. There. That's why this maximum likelihood estimator of theta is the same thing. Okay. What if, in reality, you may not know what is the correlation structure, what is the covariance structure? Like in the example I showed before, you do not necessarily know what sigma is. So one way of estimating is the so-called relaxation algorithm where you, say, you assume some value first. The typical value would be just to say, use the identity matrix. I know it's not going to be a good estimate. I'm not going to use the parameters I estimate from here. But what I will do is that I will solve this using the normal equation, which <coughs> This one down here is the so-called normal equation. Then I will look at the residuals from that model. Maybe I should just write the normal equation here. The 
So the normal equation is x transpose x theta equal to x transpose y. And now I should have called the bracket, sorry, x transpose sigma inverse x transpose sigma inverse and y. So you solve this and then you get the residuals from the model after doing this and then based on that say if you see the hiring a correlation then you estimate that correlation structure and then you propose a new sigma corresponding to that. Just like in the example before if you just have that the correlation is the time difference. Then you just have to estimate the row. You may have you have it in the, by n matrix here, but you have only one parameter. So you just have to find the row value that gives you the best match. And then you, after done that, then you go back and estimate, given this particular value of sigma, given that. Look at the correlation structure, get the estimate from that, and then you just iterate until it converges. I can say that in the case where I've done this, it converges in, I mean, depending of course how, how, how large a precision you need, but even in just two or three steps, even in one iteration, you get very close to a good value. So it's quite efficient to do this. And you just have to define convergence. Now, what you also have to consider is, well, how do you structure the sigma here? Well, of course, you cannot just estimate all the elements in there. Then it won't converge fast. But if in the case that I, I described, just have to estimate one parameter, it will converge fast. So it depends a lot on the structure that you assume for the correlation structure. And if you look at the model from before, for the radiation data here, then this is the combined model here. Well, there are no parameters down here. The only parameter that is included is the row. It would have been nice to have that in the result as well, but you cannot have everything. So, convergence is a nice thing. Now, Prediction. I said that is the most important part of this course, I think, to make predictions. And if what you care about is to have an expected value where the square prediction error, error is minimized, that's minimizing the variance effectively. Now, the other thing is normally distributed. This is just how we used to do things, and that's how we do it. What we have to do is to find the conditional expectation, and that is the optimal predictor. Just as what we did last week. Today we'll just assume that x is known. Where last week we considered <coughs> x as being a stochastic variable as well in the linear projection. So, what do we do? The easy case is, well, we know everything. It's a textbook example. You are given a model. The model includes known value of theta. And basically, if you then know what the future value of x is to be, you just calculate that. That's fairly easy. The expectation of y t plus l. Well, y t plus l contains x t plus l that's pulled on y of the theta plus epsilon t. And the expectation of epsilon t plus l is zero. We only have that. For the variance of the prediction, well, all that up there is known, so the only thing that's left is epsilon at time t plus l. What we have y t plus l equals 
takes T plus L. Now I transpose it, it's a row vector, it's not the design matrix, it's only for the particular observation. On the known theta in this case, plus epsilon T plus L. So that's the known part, it's particular at zero, the variance of this whole thing. This is a constant, just as we did over here. Known, it's a constant, everything is easy. Now, in reality, we will have unknown or estimated parameters. The expectation, y hat t plus l, is the expectation of this where we have it had it there as well. The expectation of the epsilon is again zero, so we're left with x t plus l transpose so the hat. Now the variance of this one is somewhat more complicated. How do we get to that? There is just stated. But it's one of those that is not just obvious when you look at it. So variance given the estimate due to hat of y t plus l minus y hat t plus l. What can we say about this thing? Basically, what we do is to just plug in. So This future epsilon 
is independently identically distributed as all the other epsilons. This observation that is going to be at yt plus l has not been used when making this estimate. This is a constant. That is a constant. That one is independent. So there is no covariance between this and that, which means I can split the variance the sum of two elements. Then I have this part here, the variance of x t plus l transpose on theta minus theta hat. This one here is easy. Because the variance of just the epsilons. That's just sigma squared. The second part here, well, x transpose t plus l is a constant that you multiply on something. So I can take that constant outside transpose on the left hand side because that's what it was and then I should have it on the right hand side I should have it transposed but that means it's without the transpose. Now the variance in here what we're left with is theta minus theta hat Theta is a constant. It's known. So the only thing that is left in here is the variance of theta hat. Which we have not written there, but we have it elsewhere. We have sigma square plus have it for instance down there or again over there so what we have from there is a sigma square outside and then we have an x t plus l transpose and what we have there internally is then parentheses and now this is the x this is the sign matrix <coughs> x transpose x inverse and then x t plus l not transpose. <coughs> and the last step is just to move sigma square outside of parentheses get what is written there. So what is the intuition about this? You cannot get anywhere around this. There will always be the variance that comes from the epsilon. What happens in here? Well, this is just a scale. So, this here is the x transpose x inverse. It could be a tree by tree matrix, for instance, that you infer related to the variance. So it says something about how good are my parameters estimated. And my x t plus l is saying something about how far am I away from where these estimates are made, what it's based on. I don't know if you've seen this drawing before. Univariate linear regression setting have some observations, you fill a straight line, and if you want to make predictions, you get prediction intervals that look sort of like this. Right? That means this is the mean value of the x. The further you get away from the mean value of x, the larger the variance. That's actually the same thing that happens from exactly this term down here. This is giving you x x, so it gives you an x squared, why this is a parabola, around this straight line. 
the square head of it there. So, when we do predictions in the general linear model, in practice, this is what we want to do. We want to make some prediction intervals of future values. And what we do is that we make an estimate, and then we have we take the square root of the variance, find the standard deviation of that, and then we multiply by and quantize in an appropriate t distribution. Because in reality, all these estimates will not be based on an infinite number of observations, but n minus p degrees of freedom, that's what we have. n minus p is sufficiently large. Well, then you can use the known distribution. What is sufficiently large? I have two, yeah, 30 observations. That's getting there. Obviously, if you're beyond 30, yeah, then you're mostly okay. Some would say 60. But basically, what you should do is to just look at that function there, when n is increasing, how close does it get down to something? Sometimes you just say, well, if n is sufficiently large and there are other elements of uncertainty, you just use the number 2. Good approximation. On the other hand, nowadays, when looking up in the appropriate distribution, it's not something where you have, I don't know, has any of you tried to look up in a table to find such numbers? One. Well, I have as well. Two, three, four. Ah! Any, any other one else? I want to give you something. <laughs> do you agree? That was not something you want to do over and over again. So, in the old days, where you have to, do, do the rest of you know what I'm talking about? Basically, you have a page full of numbers, you just include once you add n one by one, and sometimes you start adding more when you get to a larger number, and then you have the different percentiles, and then you can just make a linear interpolation between the numbers to get a good, well, fairly good estimate. But today, if you ask for the appropriate quantile in a t distribution, or you do it in a normal distribution, time is almost the same. Why not pick the right value? But in reality, for practical purposes, the difference between doing this and using the number two, I will sometimes, when things are again approximations, so this is exact. But when things are approximations, I will just say, well, you won't actually get to the normal distribution. You will just get to something of the order of number two. So, but when you're doing, you can say, homework and doing exercises, why not just use the right number? There's one big difference as well. When you use n minus p, you're actually showing that you know how many problems there is not just picking a random number, because it's convenient. So, today I think the prediction formula down here is, this, is one of the essential parts. The expected mean is the optimal predictor for pretty much everything we're going to do in this course. Matthew Leibniz gives you the same estimate as the weight of v square, except for the sigma hat. And then we have the ordinary least squares estimator that I assume that many of us, uh, and indeed many of you have seen that before. Yes? Why is it that we know the future value of x? It's today we say that it's a control experiment, then you know it. So there are cases where you will know and cases where you will not know. We get plenty of cases where you do not know. But today, for simplicity, we will we'll know. We will get to cases soon where the future value of x is a prediction itself. And then everything is difficult. So everything today is conditional 
on no way fix. Can I ask just how many of you have seen this expression for the weight of these square before? Oh, that's cheating. Being a TA, if you did that, raise your hand. I would uh, probably <coughs> say something different. So today there will be two exercises. I have uploaded the same solution in R for the first one, and I'll just show you one thing. Not that you actually need today, but just for those of you who have not seen it before. How many have heard about Nidder? So how many have, tends to use LaTeX whenever writing a report? Okay. Those of you who just raised your hand only once, you have to listen carefully now. The rest of you, you can figure out what you want to do. So the nice thing about doing the ticket is that you can easily typeset the mathematical formula, blah, blah, blah. You know that story. Now, the hard thing about that is when they were handling figures, handling, getting the right numbers, copy pasted. Now, what if someone changed the model? Then you have to update everything, and it may be tedious. So, instead, what you do is you take a LaTeX document, and then you include solution to exercise tree one, blah, blah, blah. You write the LaTeX code, but then you include R code. Grab that in some less than, less than, and then greater than, greater than, equal, and you can have some label in here, and you can say whether you want to show the result or not, and other things. And then you can continue after an at with some basic code. Then you can do the calculations. And basically, I have the whole solution here. I have shared this as well. All I have to do is hit compile and I get a PDF out where now I did not make things too nice. I did hide back here. I did say echo equals false some places. Echo equals false means don't show the code, just show whatever output is there. This one does not create any response. Second one here, I did not have any echo part here, so it will show me both the code that I used and the output from that. And then I can just continue and I also made a graph in here, but that graph I did not create that except for making a plot. So I just have the R code for the plot. It does keep track of what the name of the file is, stuff like that, and it's good. If you do things that kind of have a long calculation time, you can still do these things. You just have to keep track of caching things that you don't want to recalculate all the time. But I would say how I typically do things is that I play around with the R code, and then I have my skeleton uh, need a document and then I can just kind of put things easily together so when I know what I want to do code wise ish then I start building things but I will not start kind of doing all the modeling in a need document because then you have to compile all the time as well then I spend the time figuring out what is the R code but in here I can also just run the R code and start from the top of it I can easily just, within the needle document, just run the R code as regular R code. So, in the interest of time, particularly if you have many figures at some point, this is very efficient. Those of you who have used needle before, do you agree? The nodding and this, so I take that as a yes. Um, so, that was just a small advertisement, but there's no money involved.